Hello everyone, my name is Matteo and today I'm going to talk about making board games great again. That's a title which raised some eyebrows on Twitter and in real life, so I'm going to try and unpack what I really mean by that over the course of about an hour. This is a link where you can find a collection of links about this presentation and many more things that I may or may not talk about during the course of the presentation. So if you enter this URL, it will take you to this page, which has the presentation itself plus many other things. Cool. So I'll start by talking about how I make games and why I make games. And this should take about half an hour. And then hopefully through the examples that, and the projects that I'm going to show you, a set of bigger questions should emerge. And the questions around how can we use games to tackle complex questions, whether that's even possible, and how can we do that. And at this point, I will leave you with some questions that you can use yourself to try and understand what questions you may want to tackle with games what games you, will, you may want to use to tackle those questions and how can we actually do it. So let's start. This is me a few years ago and I really like this picture because I think it sums up my creative practice. When I was a young child I really loved digging holes my parents would take me to the sea and there were many things to do like swimming or playing with other people but I didn't want to do that I wanted to just be left alone and dig holes and I think this is representative of my practice because as a questioner I make things because I'm looking for answers I'm digging for answers another thing that I really loved as a child was building and rebuilding stuff with Legos and again that represents still what I do in a conceptual sense because a lot of my praxis is about making things, taking them apart, starting from things that exist, deconstructing them, putting them back together, understanding how they work and not really following the manual. Now jumping a few years ahead, that's the first game I made. At the time I was studying graphic design and I didn't set out to make a game for this project but I was digging Greek philosophy and in particular a story by Plato about people being chained inside a cave and only being able to see shadows reflected from puppets behind them and, and the story is about how some of the people inside the cave managed to first turn around and see the puppets that created the reflections that they thought at first as being reality. So the first layer of reality is the shadows, second layer of reality is the puppets, and then someone else from that cave gets out of the cave and sees the objects from which the puppets were made. So that's the third layer of reality. And which one is the real reality? So all of these questions around reality and perception and how we act and that knowledge I was really interested in and my question was can we create a playable version of that cave allegory so can you make philosophy playable that was my initial question and so through that process I I learned how to code I, I spent some time deconstructing a game that Paolo from Mall Industria sent me. And I coupled together this game, which you can see here a little snapshot of, in which you would play the, the person in the webcam, in the TV on the screen there, is your shadowy representation. And through that shadow, you influence the mood and the behavior of those little characters inside the cave, which is actually kind of reality TV show. So it was a mishmash of Greek philosophy and reality TV show and webcam experiments and it wasn't really playable, it was quite a 
bad game, but I learned a lot in the process. And also through that project, I landed my first job after university, where I worked for a few years developing educational tools and games for the likes of the BBC and Science Museum. And I kind of went down the path of becoming a developer, a coder. But then I realized that there's more to making games than just video games and just developing them through code. So I attended the Mozilla Festival in London and then the year after, in 2012, I volunteered to run a workshop. That was my first workshop, my first deep into education. And this workshop that I ran was a hack of another workshop also developed by Paolo from Mall Industria and Una Lee. And what I did was asking people to take old classic video games like Pac-Man or Super Mario and hack them with social issues and then paper prototype those, those game hacks. So making games about issues that people cared about. And it was great. I loved it. And so that left me inspired to try and do more with education. So a couple of years later, I quit my job and I started volunteering with Code Club. I became then a lecturer at Ravensbourne University. And so I shifted my focus from developing technology to helping people become creative with technology. My teaching style was all about making things, giving people objects that I could use to deconstruct like Lego and then put back together. This is the theory developed by Simo Paper called constructionism. It's about learning effectively when you are active in making tangible objects in the real world. And of course, games can be objects to think with. So this is an example from another workshop that I run in 2014 as an evolution of that Mozilla Festival workshop where I gave people both video games and board games as starting points. The method was to first get them to break down the game in terms of verbs because verbs drive games. They are the actions that people can perform within the game and then to inject new verbs into the game and see what happens. And what I noticed is that people that hacked video games tend to get sidetracked by bugs, by computer software issues, not really making anything particularly deep or personal. Whereas the people that started from board games and made their own board games ended up with really, really interesting projects, such as Givenopoly, uh, such as this game, which is a bully chasing student kind of game within the school maze. And, and this was very interesting because it was people using games as a way to express their world, express their reality. So I realized that you can use games, particularly board games in a learning environment, but not necessarily playing them, but making board games. The experience of making board games is really transformative for people. So I had an interest in board game that was reignited from those workshops. And I found this paper written by Matthew Berland and Victor Lee about using strategic board games, collaborative strategic board games, as a side for distributed computational thinking. So what do they mean here? They mean that playing board games can help you develop the computational thinking skills that would then make you a better coder. So at the time I thought that learning to code is the most valuable skill. It's still valuable, but maybe not the most valuable. Anyway, these two scholars were using Pandemic, which is arguably the most famous cooperative board game. And it's a game in which you work together as a set of medical professionals to try and defeat a common threat, which is the outbreaks of four deadly viruses around the world. So you have to travel around this world map and exchange information through cards and then trying to collect enough information to then put together antidote for each one of those four viruses. 
So what Matthew and Victor were doing was observing people playing Pandemic and seeing how they would develop over time certain skills that would help them become coders. And that was very interesting. So at the time, I had this aim to create a board game that would help people develop those computational thinking skills. And I was toying around with making a game about programming a bee. But then the idea got hijacked by another idea, or rather by a pun. So my question was, what happens if you turn a hive, which is a ecosystem, into a capitalist enterprise? So if you were to impose the profit mandate on a hive, in other words, to turn a beehive into a business, what happens? And what kind of lessons can you learn from that system? So I set out to make a game about the system of our times, which is capitalism. And it's called Business, and you can see here kids playing it. And they're playing a very early version where I was using chickpeas as flowers and chocolate chips as money. And I quickly learned that using things that the kids actually want to eat is not good for the game because all they wanted to do was to accumulate chocolate chips and then just eat them. So once I started replacing those with beans, then we could actually play the game. And the game is about extracting value from the flowers in the form of honey and then selling the honey to the market and making money. And the person that makes the most money by the end of the game is the winner. And something really interesting happens when I play this with adults, and by adults I mean friends and friends of friends, most people tend to become monsters while they play this game and to sort of just trample over everyone else and to justify it as, you know, this is just business. Whereas kids, they bring into the game their own relationships with the other kids and they also understand that the actions within the game have a consequence outside of the game. So by respecting each other, they end up creating a fairly sustainable economy for everyone without depleting the common. So that's uh, hopeful. I then spent a good chunk of 2017 creating and prototyping and playtesting various versions of business, many versions, too many versions. So I was struggling with this tension between making a fun game and making a point, optimizing the game to be fun, but at the same time I was losing some elements that I found important, which were considered not fun by the fellow designers that I was playing with. So at this point, business is really an unfinished business in the sense that I have parked it for the last year and a half and I went back to the drawing board. What I like business to be when I go back to work on it is a series of games that you can play using the same components. So interacting with flowers that represent natural resources, with honey that represents products, and with bees that represent different kinds of professions. So these three core components but with different rule sets so that you can model different types of economies. And inspiration for this type of project comes from Elizabeth Maggie, who is the inventor of the Landlords game, which then became Monopoly. So she created this game, the Landlords game, because she wanted to give people a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing, the dangers of property monopolies, and to give people an understanding of different approaches to property ownership. And she was campaigning for a land value tax, which is still a very actual proposal, to redistribute the wealth and the value created by people that work and interact within a community around land. So she created two versions of this game. One was called The Monopolist, and that was pretty much like The Monopoly that we know and hate. And the other one was called The Prosperity Rule Set. Every time that someone 
private property, everyone else would get money. And that was a way to simulate the system of land value tax. So for a strange twist of history, that game became the most popular and implicit celebration of capitalism. It became a game about ruining your family over Christmas. I have a friend who uh, told me some time ago that his marriage started to crumble over a game of Monopoly. It makes sense because Monopoly asks you to become the worst version of yourself and to pretend to have fun by doing that. And the point here is not just about Monopoly, but it's about a general tendency that we have with games where most games are optimized for fun. This is Brenda Romero. She came to the v a a few months ago and she gave an amazing talk about using games to tackle complex emotions and to tackle complex topics. She makes board games about genocide and slavery and what I really liked about her talk was when she said, you know, we, we have the technology to make this stuff. We have had board game for thousands of years, but we haven't made this kind of complex board games. Or rather, we haven't made these board games to tackle complex topics because we decided as a society that board games or games in general should just be fun, should just be entertaining, should just be about having a laugh with your friend. But, but they, they don't have to be. Then I realized that my mission was and is to make board games great again. And of course, this is a hack of a slogan by someone that I don't really want to mention, but that you surely recognize. And what do I mean by making board games great again? I mean making them cooperative, making games where people have to work together, cooperate to defeat a common threat, like in pandemic, or to achieve a common goal. And in my experience, I realized that these kind of games are very powerful because they encourage people to verbalize their thoughts. And so they offered them a way to have structured conversations and a way to think together as a group, as well as connecting with other people. Unlike competitive games where you are keeping all the information for yourself because you don't want to give away your competitive edge, your strategy. This doesn't happen in cooperative board games because it's all about sharing, thinking together, connecting with other people. And I think that it's really, really important that we develop these kind of skills. So when I parked business, I started to look into games, other games that I could hack. And this is a collection of playable board games that I found at the v a Museum of Childhood in 2017. They had an amazing exhibition called Game Plan. And the 10 best games in the world is a playable collection of games that come from different parts of the world, from different cultures, and they're all quite simple. They're all games that you can learn to play in five, 10 minutes. And they're also quite abstract, which is useful because you can then easily inject your own theme to those games. So I started a personal project, hacking all of them into what I like to call minimum playable dilemmas. So to inject these games with moral dilemmas that people have to face as they play and hopefully make them reflect about something which is connected to the game itself. So to give you an example, this is a game called Patolli, which was arguably the most popular board game in pre-colonial America. And Patolli means bean. And this is because the players would use a set of beans that were marked on one side but not on the other and they would toss them in the air if a bean landed with the mark up then that would count as a one otherwise it would count as a zero so you would do it with five or six beans then you would have a random number generator made out of food and people race around this 
cross shaped track and the first player to get back to the starting position in the center is the winner. But I really like the idea of using food as a starting point. What if we could use food, different kinds of food, as the choice element of the game? And of course I wanted to turn this game into a cooperative game. So here on the bottom right and bottom left you have the current prototype for the hacked version of Patolli, which I currently call Don't Play With Your Food. So you've got a shared hand of food cards. Each one of those cards represents a different food type. So you could have burger, for instance, uh, organic carrot, and so on and so on. On your turn, you pick one of those cards. It will have a movement. So it could be, for instance, move two or three. And then it will also give you an action, a consequence, that that type of food has on the track. And each card on the track represents land or water and food production type. So you could have organic farm, you could have an intensive animal factory, you could have desert, you could have a river. And you all start, all the players start from this point, and they have to go all around the track and back. And you win the game when you all make it back to the starting point, and you lose the game when one of you is not able to move. For instance, if you were to pick the burger food card, that will allow you to move fast because it's fast food, but you may have to remove one or two water cards around you. That's because beef has a really high impact on water resources. And if someone lands on an empty spot, then it's game over for everyone. So this is a game that makes you really think together about your food choices and the impact that those food choices have on the planet and on other people, your fellow players. So that's example number one. I'm going to talk about another two examples. This is a game called Memory, which I played a lot as a child. And it's a game where you are trying to match pairs of objects. There are two cards of the same object. You put them all face down and then on your turn you flip two at a time and if they match you take them. So I really liked playing that game when I was a child but thinking about it I realized that as a competitive game the kind of behaviors that it fosters are around hoarding, around exploiting other people's mistakes and not really sharing any information. So even though I had fun playing it I don't think that the lessons, the underlying lessons that it taught me were particularly good. So as I was doing my v &A residency a few months ago, I found several copies of games that use the similar pairing mechanics at the v &A Museum of Childhood. So I knew that I wanted to turn this kind of game into a cooperative game, but I didn't quite know how at that point. And then this lady, who was my grandma, she she died back in February and she was struggling with dementia. So we watched her memory becoming tangled and confused and we watched her losing her ability to make sense of her memories and her ability to tell us stories that were very, very meaningful to her. A few days after the funeral, I found myself scrolling through pictures and I found this one of me and Nonna playing memory just a few years ago. So I thought I must make a game about this, about memory loss. I had this idea to experiment with translucent paper as a way to try and represent this process of memories fading, memories becoming more and more confused over time. So I quickly prototyped a set of cards, the blank cards on one hand with words that represent family relationships like dad and sister and grandma and then another set of cards on translucent paper that have the same words, the same family words but framed as questions to introduce a bit of confusion and sow some doubt. So also trying to incorporate that element of time becoming very jumbled. And then I started playtesting this game at the V&A residency studio with some friends and some friends of friends and that's when the magic happened because through playing Fading Memories people can really connect with each other so this is a game about connecting people 
So how does fading memories work? You flip two cards, like in memory, and those two cards will have two words in them. For instance, brother and play. And then you use those two words to share a memory that connects those two words. So I could talk about how I played with my brother when we were kids, we were sharing the same room, in the evening before going to bed, we had this game where we tried to hide our own smelly socks somewhere and then we had to find the smelly sock. That was a game that we used to play. So I share a memory. Once you share it, you then cover it. You cover those two cards with a translucent card and then you pass on the turn to the next player. The goal of the game is still to find all the pairs. So you try to find play and play brother and brother, dad and dad. But in order to go back to a card that was previously open, you have to first retell the story that was shared in connection to that card. So if someone flipped the other brother card and wanted to then go back to my own brother card, they would have to first retell my story about playing with my brother and our smelly socks. So it's a way to share something personal, some memories, and it's also a way to start listening to each other. And it was really beautiful to observe how people opened up and shared things from their childhood or from their memories that they didn't even tell their partners about. And it's a really fun way to get to know each other. This is what fading memories looks like at the moment. I worked with my partner, Amy, to develop the visual language for this game. And one of the challenges that we faced was how do we represent things like mom or dad which have a very, very specific meaning for everyone. So we looked at abstract representations, and then we also came across this analogy. It's called the bookshelf analogy, and it's used in dementia training. And actually, we didn't come across it. It was this guy, Ollie, who told us about it. So in his dementia training, he learned that sometimes your memory is explained as a bookshelf, where on the bottom you have the emotional aspects of a memory and then on the top layer you have the logical and chronological aspects of a memory. So when you're affected by dementia, your bookshelf is shaken and the first books to fall are the ones on the top shelf. So the first thing you tend to lose are the logical aspects of remembering something. Whereas the emotions tend to be deeper and harder to shake. So we wanted to try and evoke some emotional response from players. I have a website for it. It's na.tteo.me slash fading memories. We have some 40 copies of the game painstakingly hand cut, which we're currently selling at £30. So if you want one, please get in touch. I'll be very happy to send you one. So that's game two out of three. The third game is another one that I started while being a resident at the VNA. I was based at the VNA Sackler Center, but I didn't know who the Sacklers are and how they made their wealth. But around that time, February, March, a few stories were coming out in the media about artists like Nan Golding protesting the Sacklers donations to the Guggenheim Museum New York and some of the institutions also here in the UK like the National Portrait Gallery dropping grants from the Sacklers. So I started digging and I found that they're the head of a pharmaceutical empire and one of the products they sell is a very potent painkiller and for more than 10 years They've been marketing this painkiller as kind of innocuous and they really downplayed the addictiveness of this painkiller. And then this happened. The VNA boss is apparently proud of the funding that the VNA received from his family linked to the opioid crisis. So I wasn't very happy about that and I thought maybe I can make a game about or against the Sacklers and against Mr. Hunt. But then I remembered this proverb from System Thinking, which is about looking at the rules of the game rather than the players. So looking at the game that Mr. Hunt is playing rather than looking at him. This is Donella Meadows, and she is the author of a really good book called Thinking in Systems. And so Mr. Hunt is just a player within a bigger game. 
his rule and the rules that he follows kind of force him or rather push him to say what he said in that interview and side with the people that bankroll the organization that he runs. So of course he could say other things, maybe personally he doesn't believe what he says to the media, but maybe digging into the rules of the museum game is more interesting than making some kind of protest game that focuses on him specifically or the Sackler specifically. So I started thinking about what is it like to run a museum? How do you talk about and justify and implement questions like what exhibitions to organize, what objects to acquire, what donations to accept and what donations to turn down, what services to outsource. So I started to see the museum as a complex system and my role as a game designer could be one where I make a model of that system which is necessarily simplified and then get players to experience that simplified model and hopefully they will then have a new and change understanding of that complex system and possibly will want to change it if they feel that it should be changed. So I hacked together a prototype for a cooperative game about running a museum and started looking for people that work at the V&A in different departments to come and play test it and develop it further during their lunch breaks. And this is the result of various iterations of this co-creation and play testing process. So it's a cooperative survival role-playing game in which you play as a member of the museum executive board and you make strategic decisions that will impact these four KPIs, key performance indicators. So your cooperative goal is to try and get those numbers to go up while the game is going to try and push you towards financial, reputational, morale or visual experience bankruptcy. The strategies that you work on are framed as design thinking style questions. So how might we dot 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 de-risk corporate partnerships, decolonize the museum, rethink the museum experience and so on and so on. With the strategy cards you pick one at the beginning of each round and then people have three minutes to come up with their own idea to tackle that question. They write it down then you have those KPI cards that allow you to quantify the potential impact of your strategy and you have one minute each to pitch your idea to the rest of the executive board and the other players will be able to vote for the ideas that they like the best by committing resources. Those little cubes represent resources like money, time, people that you could commit to a project and then you pick the idea that has attracted the most resources so if you have enough resources on your idea to cover its actual costs, its hidden costs, then it's a successful strategy and so you can push those numbers up, otherwise you can push them down. So in the first few workshops I was giving people ready-made cards to play with and I noticed that some people would really engage with questions around decolonization, or like bigger picture, bigger strategy kind of questions and some people just didn't want to even think about it. So I started to experiment with another approach, asking people to come up with their own questions first and then use those questions as the deck of cards. And I created this little random question generator. So let me show you how it looks and how it works. So each time you click this button, it will select a random word from these lists and spit it out as a semi-sensical question. So how might we deepen the relevance of conversations through paid exhibitions? Is that something that we want to discuss? Maybe. How might we trade performance for volunteers? How might we explore design for mums? How might we diversify conversations for philanthropists? I don't know, ask the Sacklers. How might we share debate through corporate partnerships? How might we acquire digital design through corporate partnerships? And so on. So this is a little tool that gives people an initial spark, something to react to, as opposed to a blank slate where they have to think of uh, what do I want to discuss within this game. It's a little helper to get people thinking. And we would play this part for maybe 10-15 minutes so people would come up with three or four questions each and then with say five players we would have already potentially 20 cards, 20 topics that 
they want to discuss and play with. And this made quite a big difference. People started to really engage with the questions that they wrote themselves. When they had that sense of ownership over the topic that they would discuss, then they were much more into this game. Or is it a game? Maybe it's not quite a game, but it's more of a framework. So I would refer to it with people as a game because I found that useful to get people in the right mindset. And by right mindset, I mean a playful mindset to get people to step out of their role and to think bigger or to think differently. But at the same time, it's not really a balanced game because people have so much input in creating the cards and putting down the numbers on those cards that they could really easily make it either unplayable or unwinnable or too easy to win. But that's not really the point. The point is that this is a framework of light touch rules that help people have a structured conversation, stepping into the shoes of a decision maker and imagining what a different museum or different organization could look like. So if it's not a game, how could I visualize this thing? that I created. And for some reason, this image of the sausage machine came to mind. And I think of this as a sausage machine in the sense that it's a machine that produces a sort of playful experience. But of course, sausage machines don't have a good reputation and you don't want people to go through the sausage machine. What you want instead is for people to have ownership over the ingredients of the game. So the cards, they are creating those cards. They are writing down their own questions. They're bringing their own ingredients and then they're using this sausage machine to mince those ingredients together. And the sausage machine is a machine but it's a very simple machine it's one that people can understand and I think it's fundamental actually for people to understand how the game works so that they also can get a sense of ownership on the protocols on the rules and then of course it's about making your own sausage as opposed to buying a ready-made sausage whatever that means I'll leave it with you so does it even work well it depends because if you think of institutional change as a set of behaviors that you want to impose top down on people through a fun activity, then no, it doesn't work. But if you want to facilitate a process of critical thinking and cooperative decision making, then it may work. And I say it may work because there are some aspects that are really key. First of all, it is a cooperative game. So the game itself forces you to work together, forces you to talk to each other, to think together. It's a simple game. It's hackable in the sense that you have a very strong input in shaping the game. And the rules of the game are optimized for fairness. So you want to give everyone the same chance to, in the same time, to be heard, which is something that doesn't really happen in normal meeting, even between co-workers, and to steer conversations away from numbers management and to towards more qualitative conversations. So this is the museum game. I want to really test it in the future with smaller organizations or other nimbler organizations where I could see whether some of the ideas, some of the strategies that come out of the game can be actually implemented, which is something that would be very, very slow and bureaucratic to try at the v &A. And that's it. That's the third out of three games that I wanted to talk to you about today. So the bigger question now is, can we actually use games to tackle complex questions? So let's unpack that. First of all, we should be clear on what questions we want to ask. What kind of problems do we want to solve? And this is before we even consider whether that question could be tackled through a game or through something else. The questions that we could consider are on a spectrum from affecting our personal behaviors. For instance, I want to eat more healthy food or I want to learn a new language, all the way up to, on the other end of the spectrum, systemic questions. For instance, how do we provide healthy food to as many people as possible? Or how do we make education free or affordable? So if you want, at this point, you could pause the video. If you are with someone else, talk to them, otherwise on your own, spend some time thinking about what are the burning questions that you would like to explore. Don't think about games yet. Think about what would you like to explore. Then, once you have 
a few ideas about questions that you would like to tackle, we start considering what games could be useful to tackle those questions. And games can be thought of as conversational interfaces or conversational frameworks where you use the structure of the game, the rules of the game, to get people to talk about whatever it is that you want them to talk about. And then you also have games that are system simulations where you get people to play as part of this system and through that you get them to explore alternative systems or different moving parts within that dynamic system. So now if you want, pause this video, pick one of the questions that you identified and start thinking about what games you could make around this bigger question. There are some resources that I would recommend if you want to come up with game ideas. So there is an encyclopedia of mechanics, this book here, which is a bit like a cooking book. You, you have a vague idea of what kind of flavor you're going for and then you start looking at recipes and then there are others. But anyway, you can go and explore them yourself. A series of interesting choices is an interesting game and this one too. And finally, once you have a few ideas about games that could tackle the question that you picked, start thinking about how do we actually do it? Because it doesn't necessarily have to be a game that other people play, but it could be a workshop where people hack a game that you made or where people make their own game around that topic. So instead of providing them with a sort of ready-made sausage, you give them some ingredients and maybe the activities about chopping them up or the activities about foraging more. <laughs> more ingredients. If you want, pause this video and have a think about that. In my experience, the more transformative potential of games is not in playing them, it's actually in making them and facilitating that game making process for other people. Right, I'm pretty much done. As I said before, at this URL, you can find all of the links to this presentation and to all of the resources that I've been mentioning throughout the presentation. Thank you so much for watching and if you want, follow me on Twitter and have a great day.